Good morning, ICC. My name is Vaidela, and I'm your service leader for today. I want to take this time to welcome all of you seated here this morning and to say that you're very welcome, and may God bless you for coming. And for those of you who are watching us online, I pray that the presence of God will be with you also in the name of Jesus. Before I give you a rundown of the program, I would like us to go to God in a word of prayer. Amen? If you can stand wheresoever you are, it will be nice. Or if you feel like being seated, it's okay. But it will be nice if you can stand to give glory to God. Amen? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this blessed morning. This is the day you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for bringing us together once again to glorify your holy name. Thank you, God, for the breath of life. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for seeing us through the past week and safely brought us into the starting of a new week. We thank you for it, my Lord and my God. This morning we are gathered in your presence, O Lord. We come before you, O God, just as we are. We ask you in the name of Jesus that you will bless our time in your presence this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that wheresoever we have fallen short of your glory this morning, we ask that you will create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us, cast us not away from your presence, but restore unto us this morning, O God, the joy of your salvation that we will worship you in spirit and in truth, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will come. Come and have your way this morning in this place. Touch each and every life present here this morning. Even those who are on their way coming, we pray that you will bring them safe to this place in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for all that will happen here today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for every aspect of worship this morning. Father, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. We commit the speaker into your hands, my Lord and my God. I pray this morning, O oh God, that he will speak the oracles of you this morning, that the words that will come from his mouth, my Lord and my God, they will come directly from the throne of heaven this morning, that will bless our hearts, O oh God, that will deliver us, O oh Father, that will bring joy into our lives, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that will bring deliverance, my Lord and my God, that will bring redemption this morning, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Use him as your vessel this morning, O oh Father, in the name of Jesus. And whatsoever the enemy is trying to do, Father, this morning, we come against it and we declare this place a holy ground for you this morning in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name I have prayed. Amen. Amen. Now I will give you a rundown of the program and then we will go ahead. Hallelujah. When I move from those places, we have two people who will be reading the Psalms for us because we are not allowed to sing. So we are reading the Psalms, which is a form of worship unto our God. Hallelujah. So Atumomi and Kayode will be reading the Psalms for us this morning in the name of Jesus. And after the Psalms, we'll have our Lillian Chandra who will give us a testimony in the name of Jesus. And after the testimony, We'll have our speaker who will come and deliver the word of God this morning. We are very excited <laughs> to hear what God has put in your heart for us this morning. And after which, I will come back and give some announcement. Amen? I pray that you will have a blessed time in the presence of the Lord this morning. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I would, like, I would like to read a Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from far. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You, Lord, know it completely. You hate me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit when I can flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depth, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the down, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depth of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of, the, one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the seed of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young white ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the hooks and strikes the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the floor. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. Thus we hand the scripture. May God bless the word in our heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Good morning. I'd like to um, share a testimony uh, about my family. I'm from Singapore, you know, originally. And um, I have one biological brother. So he's married with two children but he works in China while the rest of his family live in Singapore. So sometime in February last year, I received a call that my sister-in-law um, was diagnosed with cancer and it was stage four. And the cancer have actually spread to many parts of the body, the important organs, the liver, the thyroid, the colon, and who knows where else. So her days were actually numbered. So each phone call I have to make to my brother, and it was all this crying and wailing. Everybody was in desperation, right? And here you are 10,000 miles away. <laughs> what can you do? There's so little you can do, right? So I prayed. That was the best thing. And God gave me wisdom, cast out to a network of resources you have, and they are all not safe except my niece and nephew. So uh, God was good. Uh, there were people there who are willing to say, we are going to stand on your behalf, families, friends came in and then people start reaching out to them practically as well as spiritually. 
and my sister-in-law got safe in this crisis. That, that's the best thing that have happened. Um, but the fight continues. So I remember I was there in July last year and um, it was almost farewell speech. You know, when I look at her honestly at that time at the hospital, she was dying. She was dying. And I went to see the oncologist and they were trying all kinds of chemotherapy on her, but the chances were very slim. And I tell him, can you tell me honestly? I actually went in to have a private meeting with him. How many days does she have? I said, maybe six months the most. And it was hard for me to have to release this news, right, to my brother in China. and my, my um, But I keep praying and trusting God. And you know what? Now it's November 2020. She's still alive. Amen. She's still alive. And her latest uh, report is the, the tumor in the liver, especially the liver is the most, has shrunk, you know. And, um, and the COVID that came in beginning of this year have actually benefited her because, you know, the thing is an either mind is a devil's workshop. So if she just focused on her cancer, it's not good. So through the COVID, she was able to still keep her job and work from home, you know, and that is very therapeutic for her. So through it all, I want to thank God. I want to thank God she's still alive and, and she is... Um, growing in the Lord. And, and I tell my family, the most important thing is whatever that will happen to her, each day is a gift from God. Each day is the grace of God that she's alive. But um, the most important thing is to secure her eternal healing in heaven. Yeah? So every day that God has extended for her is a blessing. It's a blessing for her. I want to share this to encourage you. All of us, most, most of us here are foreigners, you know, and it's alarming when we receive news about our family so far away. And what can you really do? You know what I mean? And it's not easy uh, caring for them overseas. Right now, it's seven hours difference. You know, we always have to match timing and there's all this hospital checkup. But you know what? That verse that have kept me through is in First Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your cares. Cast. To cast is to throw, really throw with force. Uh, after doing everything you can do, cast all your cares your anxieties, your worries, because there's only so much you and I can do. You know what I mean? Humanly speaking. Cast it to who? To God. He's bigger. Say, God, you're not limited by distance. You can take care of them. And he did. He saved my sister-in-law and he brought people on my behalf to look after them. So I just want to share this to encourage you. Remember, cast all your cares on God, for he cares for you. Amen. Amen. And I would like to move on to the next part of the service as we are going to prepare to welcome our preacher this morning. He's no stranger to us. I'm so used to calling you Mr. Dalton. It's very hard to call you Charles. Um, Charles has been a principal to my um, two sons, and uh, we have been very thankful for the safe environment. Um, good foundation that they have been in the school, and now they have, of course, moved on to yeah, become adults, but uh, thank you for what you're doing, and we appreciate very much. I think we still have parents who have children who are in the school, and we are so thankful for, for what you're doing, investing in the life of our children. So um, as Ravi is going away, he, he always uh, know that he can count on Charles to come and share the word on his behalf to us. So we have the privilege and opportunity of having Charles. For some of you who don't know him, he's actually originally an Englishman but born in Tanzania to missionary parents. So a part of him is African. <laughs> I don't know how much Swahili he can still remember. You can test him out after the service for those of you who are uh, Swahili speaking. And um, thank you for your willingness to come and minister to us. I would like to hand the pulpit to you at this time. Yeah. Could we just give him a warm welcome? Thank you very much, and good morning to all of you. Um, I'm searching for a clock. I'll put this one up here. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning to share with you the, the Word of God, the Word which the Lord has laid on my heart. I've spent the last couple of years thinking an awful lot about uh, the goodness of God. So the title of my message this morning is God is Good. And you know, 
We've just heard a testimony of the goodness of God. We've just read the Psalms, which express some of the goodness of God to us. And it's important that written on the tablets of our hearts is this very fact. We need to understand who God is, because when we understand who God is, we're able to live the life which he has called us to live. You know, as human beings, it's easy for us to forget. And I think sometimes it's been almost tradition in the church to blame God for things which happen in this world due to our poor choices by saying, well, it's the will of God. I believe even in those circumstances, when we make poor choices, and our poor choices have repercussions on society and on nature, which we're experiencing in these years, in the midst of our poor choices, God is still good. He gives us the freedom to choose. He gives us the freedom to make our own choices. We make good choices because we're created in the image of God, but we also make poor choices because we are still in this spiritual battle while we live here on earth until the new heaven and the new earth come and all that will be passed and we'll live in all eternity with our good God. Our God is good. He was good in the Old Testament. We only saw glimpses of, glimpse of it. We only see glimpse of, glimpses of it when we read some of the Old Testament passages. But we can believe that God is good. Some of those passages I can't explain to you, but I rest in the fact that God is good, even when I read those passages that I don't understand. I won't blame on God the things which happen in this world. He has, given us the choo- he has given us the freedom to choose, and we do choose. And our choices sometimes affect society and the people around us. They affect nature. But it's so encouraging to know the hope that we have. And that's what we're going to think a little bit about this morning. Um, as I was working on this idea that God is good, one of the things I came across was this statement here, God is in a good mood. And that made me smile. You know, often we project on God our Father, our earthly fathers. Now, my earthly father, he was a loving man, but he was also strict, and he was a disciplinarian. And one thing I can tell you is my father wasn't always in a good mood. Sometimes I didn't dare to even go and ask him for something, because he was... He was strict. Now, that's the way we were brought up in the, in, in the 50s and 60s. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I had a strict father. I didn't even like to look in his eye when I'd done something wrong. I prepared, prepared to, hide, to hide from him. You know, and I do believe that I have in the past projected that image of my earthly father onto my heavenly father. The thought that he's, he's when, when I do things wrong, he's not in a good mood. I have to go with my head down and dare to look him in the eye. But the fact of the matter is God does not change. He's exactly the same. He's the same on the days when I was a good boy. He was the same on the days when I was a bad boy. I could look into his face. I could accept his love for me and his compassion and his tender heart and his love for me expressed in so many ways because God is always in a good mood. God is always good. He doesn't change. Let's go back to the beginning of the world, the Garden of Eden. And we read here, the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord, Lord God, among the trees of the garden. Now, I like this picture that's painted here. You know, I imagine, can you imagine this? Let's go back even further, a few verses further back in in, in Genesis. And we have the description of how it is that the Trinity, who are in this love relationship with each other, we know that for a fact because God is love. And they say to each other, let us create man in our own image. So this God of love decides to create the world which we live in, decides to create you and I. I think of it in this way. It's a little bit like parents. I mean, just... uh, a new bit of information, my, my son and daughter-in-law, they actually um, uh, were given the gift of a new child on Thursday. 
Praise the Lord. Thank you. Ava, Ava Viola is her name. And of course, we're proud of her. That's our second grandchild. But you know the idea that my son and my daughter-in-law, Nicholas and Maria, they, of course, in love, procreated this child. Yes, a gift from God. And they prepare a home for the child. They prepare a place where they can receive it and they can look after it and they can nurture it. They've bought all the necessary equipment. They've made sure they have the right clothing. They've made sure they have the right size nappies and so on. They have created this environment for this child that they love. And I love that picture that is of the, our creator God, who in his goodness and in his love, he created this world. He prepared this world for us, for you and I. And here it is. Adam and Eve, they make poor choices. They make a poor choice. But I can imagine before they made this poor choice, that this was the standard thing that happened. As they enjoyed this Garden of Eden that God had provided for them, everything was laid on, all they needed. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to go to work. They were given food to eat. All their needs were met by, the God, in his, by God in his goodness and in his love. And they made a poor choice. And here's the next morning, or the next evening, of course it is. And God comes walking in the garden. And I believe that's probably what he did every day. He came to have fellowship with them and to talk with them and express his love to them in that way. But on this day here, what do they do? They hide. They don't want to look into the smiling face of their heavenly father. They have a bad conscience. They go and hide and they turn away from it, much as we do much as I did with my father. There's actually something quite interesting in the, uh, the Hebrew language which is used. You know, we know this blessing here, the Aaronetic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord first turn his face towards you and give you peace. I love the idea that you have here. This idea of a God whose face is smiling on us. He's in a good mood. He turns his face towards us. You know, we saw that picture of our, our tendency is to hide our, to turn away from God because we think he's angry, because we think he's disappointed with us. But when he wants to bless us, we see him turning his face towards us. We see him looking into our eyes. We see him smiling. We see him expressing his goodness. We see him expressing his love for us. We see him expressing his concern for us. We see him expressing every need that we have, looking to fulfill it for us. That's the God who we worship. That is the good God who created this world and that created us. Here's another verse. Because I think we have, I mean, I think this is a very important fact which we, we see in this verse here. Sing praises to the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. We have this tendency, I believe, I'm sure you do the same thing that I do, because I know I do this. When I make a poor choice, and I have a guilty conscience, yes, God is not pleased. God could be angry. And what do we as human beings tend to do? We tend to turn our face from God, hide. We have this feeling that there needs to go a certain amount of time before we can go back to God in worship and look into his smiling face. We feel as if we have to punish ourselves. We feel we have to pay some sort of price before we can do that again. We have this idea that God is just like my father was. You know what the worst thing was that my father could do to me if I misbehaved? And of course, I did that very occasionally. But the worst thing my father could do to me, he was send me to the bedroom. You ever have ever, ever, ever had that done to you? You've done something incorrect. What's the worst thing? Get sent to the bedroom. 
and you're sat in the bedroom there. And it might only take two or three minutes. It feels like two or three hours. While you're sat there trying to think of excuses that you can deliver to, well, I could deliver to my father to appease him. Because I have this picture of him being angry with me. You know, I believe we, we, if we're not careful, we can have exactly the same picture of God. God is angry with us, and we turn our face from him. Isn't it encouraging to, work, to read here? His anger lasts only a moment. His anger lasts only a moment. Yes, he is angry. Yes, he's displeased. How could he be anything else but that? He is a holy God. But his anger lasts only a moment. And we can come to him and we can confess and we can be forgiven and we can be cleansed. And within a moment, we can turn our face to him. We can look into his eyes and see his smiling face and know that we are accepted, fully accepted, the way we are. We don't, first of all, have to do 20 good deeds. We repeat the Our Father 50 times or whatever it might be the picture you have in your mind. I'm exaggerating now to make a point. His anger lasts only a moment. Isn't that encouraging? He's a good God. He wants to express his goodness to us. This comes from the story of the rich young man. Actually, I think we've jumped some here now. We'll come to that a bit later. Let's read this here. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is just an example of a verse here where you have this word from the Hebrew which is translated presence. You fill me with joy in your presence. Now that Greek word in other places is translated the face of God. So the idea you have here is you're not just talking about being in his presence in the same room. You're actually talking about in his presence, looking into his face, just like in the blessing, and God is smiling on you. So when you read the Psalms, you'll see this again and again, talking about being in his presence. You see, I want you now going forwards to think, ah, what was it Charles said? He said, ah, the Hebrew word can also be tra translated in uh, the countenance of God or God's face. And I just like to think God's smiling face as he looks upon me and he looks to bless me as described here in this verse. And that brings joy. In his eyes is expressed his joy in me. In his eyes is expressed his joy in you as you spend time in his presence in worship or in prayer or in just contemplation. This idea of God favoring us, this idea of God wanting the very best for us, comes out in this expression here, in this well-known verse. And in this well-known well verse, there is actually only one condition. The condition, the only condition there is, is actually to believe God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is good and that he is a loving God and that he sees us, and that he will expect, wants to express his kindness to us, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I think often we, we think God is, you know, he's angry with us. He's angry with us when we don't quite go his way. He is looking to punish us, but God is looking that when we turn to him, and we seek his presence, and we seek his face, he's looking to favor us. He's looking to reward us. He's looking to be gracious to us. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. We talked about that love relationship there was in the very beginning of the world in the Trinity. The Father loved the Son and the Son loved the Father and etc. And here, look at this verse here. This is from John chapter 15. We are invited into this love relationship. An expression we can think of love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are invited into the same relationship. As the Father 
has loved me, says Jesus, so have I loved you. And that would be true of the Father, and that would be true of the Holy Spirit. They love us as the Father loved the Son. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here is where we find joy, is understanding God's goodness to us, understanding God's love to us, understanding that he's inviting us into a relationship which the God had before the beginning of the world. Now, of course, sometimes we think God can't be good in all situations. Look at all the problems in the world. Look at the problems of society. Look at people. He can't always be good. We don't say it in that way, but more often than not, that's exactly what we're saying when we question God's goodness to whatever it is that happens in our lives, to what it is we're going through at this very moment in time. We question God's goodness. But the fact of the matter is that nothing is impossible for God. The very first time we come to Christmas time soon, but one of the expressions of God's goodness to us, one of the greatest expressions of God's love to us is in the nativity story. God came to earth to express his goodness and his love to us. He came through impossible circumstances. Let's just read shortly, remind ourselves of the story here. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent his angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary's thinking, okay, how in the world is that going to happen? I'm a virgin. I'm not married. How can it be that I should conceive a son. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was, who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Or as it says in some of the other translations, nothing is impossible for God. And I think this is a fantastic example of fact of what God is able to do. If God wants to come and show his favor to us, if God wants to come and express his goodness to us, there's nothing that can stand in the way. Not even old age. Not even a woman who is a virgin, Mary who is a virgin. It's possible for God. God is able to bless us. God is able to show his goodness in the most difficult of circumstances, he is able. There's nothing that stands in his way. He wants to bless. He can bless. Here's the story of the rich young ruler I mentioned earlier on. He comes to and says, what do I have to do to, inter to inherit eternal life? And he talks about how he's kept all the commandments. And Jesus says to him, go and give all your wealth to the poor. And he goes away saddened. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, and they asked, who then can be saved? We could, we've got to admit this is one of the ultimate examples of a God goodness to us, that he has provided salvation for us. He's, he, he has provided a way forward for us. Jesus looked at them and said, 
With man, this is impossible. But with God, things are possible. It's possible for God to take even the hard heart of this rich young man, probably proud of all that he'd done and all that he'd achieved. It's possible for God to take his heart and to melt it and to make it like clay in his hands and to, to have his will and able to save this man if only he will repent. It is possible. It's always possible. It is always possible for God to show his goodness. I'm sure you're praying for members of your family who are not believers. You're concerned about them. God is good. He is also able to be good to them and show his favor to them. Circumstances might appear to be very difficult, but God can use circumstances. We just heard the testimony from, from Lillian, how circumstances can be used to lead a person to faith. Praise the Lord. Now, central, of course, to this message of God's goodness and to any message which we ever preach, of course, is the cross. It's the cross that is central. Because on the cross, everything has been dealt with. So when we say nothing is impossible for God, one of the key factors, of course, in our world is the fact that at the cross, everything has been dealt with. There is a solution to everything when we look to the cross. You know Psalm 103, which we'll look at in a moment, which expresses the many facets of the work of the cross. But more often than not, when we think of the cross, we think of God's love being expressed to us because that is what the Scripture tells us. How is it God loved us? How is it that God was good to us? God sent his one and only Son to come and to die for us, to give his life for us. God's goodness, God's love is expressed at the cross. How is it possible for him to bring to salvation the rich young man by way of the cross? How is it possible for him to, to save anyone, to save you and I? It is by way of the cross. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my innermost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit or from death and crowns you with love and compassion and satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The question of sin, the question of disease, the question of death, the sting of death solved at the cross. Through the cross, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth where the problems of this world will be solved as well. And that's by, because of the cross of Christ that that's possible. I like the last sentence there. I'm claiming that for my life. Your youth is renewed like the eagle's to experience that every day, to speak that over my life. Lord, you have promised. Your youth is renewed like the eagles. It's a fantastic psalm. I'm sure you will know it well. Worth, re worth reading. Worth reading as God's message to you personally as you read through it. He forgives your sins. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. We have hope. He gives strength even when old. He gives strength in trying circumstances. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you lack anything? No. You feel you lack something? Maybe. But listen to this. Read this. Proclaim this over your life as well each day. The Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's the Father who's done that, I said, Jesus Christ. The Father has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. 
We are joint heirs with him. Everything Jesus has, has we own as well. It's a fantastic life that we've been called to. We have every blessing that's necessary. We don't need to walk with our heads hanging low. We can, we can claim the blessings that the Father has sent our way. The last point I want to make is the fact that um, we are significant. I think sometimes that's our problem. We don't like to admit it, of course. You know, even us men who like to be macho, like to put on a, a strong face, we put on a mask as if we can handle everything. But I do believe inside of all of us, there is this battle, some, more for some than others, of this idea of, you know, and in this context, what I'm saying is this, we think God's a good God, but why would he be good to me? Look at the sort of person I am. Or at least, in the very least, we turn our face away from the good God and we look at ourselves and we look at our shortcomings and we look at what the lack there is in our life and we forget all the promises that good, our good God has given us, some of them which we've just read. We are significant. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the ways which really encourages me is to think about some of the names which my heavenly father, my good father, calls me. Some of the things he, he mentions. I'm going to take a few examples. We could go on for a long time. I've already mentioned one. We're joint heirs with Christ. We have all sorts of titles through the scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And to sit and think about them and repeat them and say, this is what the Father thinks of me, my Heavenly Father thinks of me. This is what He calls me. I think we can find their encouragement. I think there we begin to understand the significance we have before our good God. We begin to understand and appreciate and live in the freedom which that gives us. So we're not tied down by our thoughts about ourselves, But our heads are lifted high because of, we think about what the Father says about you and me what he thinks of us when he looks at us. One of the things we need to remember is what's expressed in this verse here. We need to remember that we are in a spiritual battle because that's what it's all about. Jesus speaks to, is, is, is saying this to the Jews here. He says, why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I will admit that there went many years in my life where Although I knew the fact that I had a, um, an enemy, although I believed that the devil was a person, it actually had no impact upon the way I lived my life at all. I just carried on as if there was no um, enemy. I do believe that the negative thoughts we have about ourselves which, by the way, are, are lies. We see from this verse, they come from one place. Where do the lies come? The negative thoughts when we pull ourselves down, or we do it to other people for that matter, but let's think about ourselves. The negative things we about us, say about ourselves, when we think we're not good enough, when we think we're not able to, God calls us to say we can't, we don't have the ability. When we feel insecure, They're lies. They're not the truth. The truth is found in the Word of God. It's there that we can find the truth about ourselves. It's there we can understand who we are and why it is that God can be good to us always in all kinds of circumstances, that he can always look on us and smile. 
the reason why he's always in a good mood is because of who we are. Who we are, we are in Jesus Christ, our identity. We say sometimes our identity in Christ. The father of lies. He's working against us. He's working against the kingdom of God. He is our enemy. Our flesh is also our enemy. The world around us is also our enemy. But the father of lies, whom all lies come from, he certainly wants us to believe his lies, any sort of his lies, whether it be about doctrine, but also whether it be about us, our very selves. Now, I'm sure you've heard this said many times, and I'm going to challenge it this morning. Let's imagine a situation. I don't know if this is you. I'm not talking about you anyway. I'm making this up. You're the sort of person who you lose your temper all the time. And every time you lose your temper, you feel disappointed. And what we say sometimes is this. We say, oh, I'm just, you just have to accept me the way I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Now, I would argue that that's a lie. We're not sinners. We're saints. We'll come to that in a minute. Yes, we were sinners, would be more accurate to say, I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. But you see, we use that as an excuse, and it's a lie. We use it as an excuse just to carry on living the way we're living, without looking to see the Spirit of God work in our lives to change us. Without expecting the Spirit of God to develop His fruits in our lives, so that we change and we change day by day to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe this lie. And we say, we forget that we're a new creation. We're not the old creation. We're a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. That's what we can believe. And we can believe that we will change. We can believe that we will grow more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ as we look into his face, as we understand who he is, as we understand our identity. It will change us. It will transform us. The word of God will transform you and me. It's a lie to make that excuse. Well, this is the way I am. Just take it or leave it. Well, the last is probably two. We should do that of each other and be gracious to each other. But I believe we also expect of ourselves and each other to see transformation and growth. The Bible says we're a saint. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of the evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you to Christ, Christ's physical body through death, to present you wholly in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. We're saints. We're a new creation. We had this verse read to us already today. We're wonderfully made. Why would we put ourselves down? Why would we think negative things about ourselves and the way we've been created? More often than not, we can do nothing about it anyway. But the fact of the matter is, in the eyes of the God, we have been wonderfully made, just the way we are. You know, even me with my strange nose and my strange hairstyle, etc., that's the way I've been made. That is part of God's design for me. It does not hinder me. It does not hinder God in my life. I have been wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, Lord God. Why would I think otherwise? But we do, don't we? This is the antidote. The thoughts that we have of ourselves, which are lies, is to say, what does God say about me? What does the Father say about me? We're also God's temple. This is something which has really spoken powerfully to me over the last few months. I mean, I'm sure you have the same picture I have. When I was in Sunday school, I learned Psalm 122. You know, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And that's a fact. 
you know, sometimes, suddenly, I, I, the other, I was thinking about this not long ago, and I began to realize that is often the picture I have of my Heavenly Father. You know, when I want to, almost as if when I'm going to pray to him, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Now, that's a fantastic picture from the Old Testament of the Bible. And of course, that was the reality in those days. The temple of God was on, on Zion, which is at the top of a mount. That was the picture they had of God up on, on the mountain where Moses met him and they received the, the, the Ten Commandments. This idea of God being up on a mountain was part of their world. In the Old Testament, God visited them with his Holy Spirit. There was a visitation culture. And the Holy Spirit came and visited his prophets and his servants, and they're able to, do, to, or able to prophesy, they're able to, to work miracles. So that was the world in the Old Testament they lived in. Now, but the interesting thing is, and it's fascinating thought if you think about it, that in the New Testament, after the cross, after the, the veil in the temple was rent in two, we now have this very close access to God. And what's more than that, believe it or not, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they live in me. They're right here in me. What was a visitation culture in the Old Testament is now a habitation culture in the New Testament, which we are part of. God lives in me. God lives in you. He's with you wherever you go. That is fantastic, I believe. And I can expect God to speak to me in my innermost being and to strengthen me there as well. We're also called the Bride of Christ. And this is a, these are verses taken from the last book in the Bible, Revelation. Hallelujah! For our Lord God the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And the bride has been herself, has, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And we know from the scripture that we are called the bride of Christ. And the bridegroom is Jesus Christ. And it's a fantastic just to think about the relationship between a bridegroom and a bride is used to, by, by, by the Father to express our relationship to God. You know, um, Song of Solomon, I think it's actually fun to take Song of Solomon and read it as, it as it is expressed in this relationship there is between two lovers, this relationship there is between a bridegroom and a bride. To look at some of the terminology which is used there, the pictures which are used there, and I believe that this is God expressing the way he sees us and looks upon us. This is just a, a small example here. Um, I can't read that at the back, so I'll read it up here. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys, says the young woman to, her, to her, her, her male friend. And he says, like a lily amongst thorns is my darling amongst young women. She says, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I, de I delight to sit in his shade. And his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. And you see the expression here of the bridegroom speaking to the bride and saying, my darling, or as we would say in days gone by, my beloved. I do believe that that is exactly the terminology which our Heavenly Father uses of us when he talks to us. He says, my beloved, or as in the modern version, my darling. Some of the lies we can believe, you know, we pull ourselves down. We can have gone through circumstances of life where we end up being alone for one reason or another. And that's the picture we see of ourselves. Ah, oh, I'm alone. I'm divorced. I'm widowed. I'm still single. And we can end up thinking that no one loves us and no one appreciates us. And those are the lies of the devil we just talked about. The fact of the matter is we can read Scripture and we can have this intimate communion with our Heavenly Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ, where he expresses to us his love for us and his desire to know us 
and his desire to be involved in our lives. He also calls us his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because the servants does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. We can be lonely sometimes. Let's go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. And let's receive his friendship. Let's live in his friendship. Let's learn to, to live in his presence. Let's learn to spend time with him and to get to know him. So that becomes a very part of us, that we're his friend. God is good. God is good all the time. God is in a good mood. He's smiling on you. He looks into your face, straight into your eyes, each one of you. And he says, I love you. He wants to be good to you. I want to show you my favor. Will you believe? I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm always good. Will you believe? Will you come to me? Will you trust? I will show you my favor. I will bless you. I will cause my face to shine upon you. I will be gracious to you. We read it again and again in the scriptures. Will we accept that? We can accept that because God is good. We deserve God's goodness. Nothing is impossible. Any, of the, any circumstances, God is good, is able to turn them for the very best. That is the promise of Scripture. He can take them and He can show His goodness to us through the worst of circumstances. He can change us. He can transform us into the likeness of His Son because the cross has dealt with anything, with, with, with everything. His anger lasts just for a moment. You know why you can believe that? Because the price is paid on the cross. The cross has dealt with everything. Therefore, we can believe that God's anger is for a moment. Therefore, we can look into his face and he is smiling. Even when we've made poor choices. Even when we've made the worst choices. Even when we get flashbacks from terrible choices we've made in our life. Let's remember that God's anger lasted because that's old. It lasted then for a moment. The cross covers our sins. It cleanses us. It delivers us. The cross has dealt with everything. And we are significant. In Christ, we are significant. He loves us deeply. He longs to be good to us. He shows his goodness in so many ways. Let's praise his name. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we come to you in worship. We worship you, a good God. We glorify your name. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can work with our, that we can walk with our heads lifted high because in you we are significant. We thank you that nothing is impossible for you. We thank you that on the cross you have solved all the problems of this world. We thank you that on the cross we can find salvation. We thank you that we can find healing. We thank you that we can find hope for the future. We thank you that death does not have a hold, will never have a hold on us and in this world. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again as proof of the fact. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with us and continue to transform us into the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Each day as we walk with you, may we experience fellowship with you. May we experience intimate fellowship with you. We call you to walk beside us as our friend. We want you to go with us in this coming week. Come, Father. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you been blessed this morning? Amen. Have you been blessed this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Charles, for the words of encouragement. I have been blessed, and I know each and every one of us here have been blessed this morning. God loves us. 
It doesn't matter our state. It doesn't matter our condition. He still loves us. We are significant. Hallelujah. Remember that, that we are significant. God loves us. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for that word of encouragement this morning. God richly bless you. May God fill you up this morning in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Now we'll take some announcements. Yes, announcement time is blessing time. Hallelujah. Yes. This morning, we are going to worship God with our offerings and our tithes. Hallelujah. And um, you can see the numbers on the screen. If you want to worship God through your offering this morning, you can use mobile pay. The number is 97197. And also those of you at home, you can also worship God by giving your offering, sending it via mobile pay on 97197. And... Um, for your missions pledge, you can use 222233. And for New Year's pledge, you can use 622898. And if you want to make a bank transfer, the Odenska Bank transfer number is 4065-4065-957450. So let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your precious word that you have given us, given to us this morning. Father, you always remind us of your love for us. We thank you that you love us so much that you gave your only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. God, this morning, we present our offering to you. We ask in the name of Jesus that you bless it, O God. May it be used for the furtherance of your work on earth in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your generous provision in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Yes, we'll continue with the announcement. And last week, we renew our pledges, you know, for the missions. We are supporting six missionaries in different parts of the yeah, I, we are supporting six missionaries in different parts of the world. And I would like to encourage you, if you were not here last week and you would like to be a part of the missions pledge, this form is available. You can just put your hands up and the usher will come to you with a pledge. I will encourage you because where you cannot reach, your finances can reach there and it can make a difference in the lives of people. Hallelujah. So support the work of missions. When you support the work of missions, I tell you, you are blessing so many lives, and God will also bless you. Amen. We are supporting Joshua in Ghana, Accra, Ghana, and Ezra in East Malaysia, Carol and Darina in Czech Republic. Arasu is living in London, but he's doing a great work in Uganda. And we have David Zadok in Jerusalem. So please be a part. Put your hands up. If you were not here last week and you want to be a part, just raise up your hands. Our usher is ready to hand you over the form so you can be part of what God is doing around the globe. Hallelujah. Every Sunday, we are meeting upstairs for our morning prayers. It starts at 9.30 to 10 and which afterwards will come down and finish the prayers from 10 to 10.20. So I will encourage you to come and be a part of the prayer team. You know, prayer changes things. Hallelujah. Prayer can change circumstances and situations. Amen. So come and be part of the prayer team, and God will bless you. Hallelujah. Your situations will change in Jesus' name. We are also continuing with our midweek prayers on Wednesday. Every Wednesday we are meeting here from 6 to 8. It's only two hours. We are in with, start with thanksgiving. You know, thanking God for the, so many things he is doing in our lives and for the things he has done. You know, and even we thank him for the things we know that he is going to do. 
because he never changes. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Amen? So come and be a part of the Wednesday meeting. It is very, very enriching, I'm telling you. Come and be a part, and your life will be blessed. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Are you happy? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Today is not cold. Amen. It's not that cold outside today. So we are happy. November is still warm. We we'll praise God for that. Amen. Okay. So our children church is in operation now. Amen. So please remember to drop your kids for their children's uh, various children's churches. And remember to pick them up. Please don't forget them. <laughs> remember to pick them up when you are leaving. Children's church start at 1030. Amen. And next Sunday, Ravi will be preaching a message on Christians being bullied. Hallelujah. Hmm. Christians being bullied. Amen. I look forward. Hallelujah. Yes, because sometimes we think because we are Christians, we have to be like a doormat. Eh? So people, they take advantage of us. They bully us. So come and be blessed and know your rights. Hallelujah. Come and know your rights. Hallelujah. And God will richly bless you. Come and be expectant. And yes, we are, our home groups are still on, live and on online. They are now in operation. If you, you can see Lillian, if you want to be a part of a home group, amen. We were really very blessed this past Friday. We had a great time in Lungpu with our brother Solomon, amen. We had the, our home cell with him. And it was his birthday, so we had a great time. A fantastic message, I'm telling you. Staying, uh, staying joyful as a Christian. It was a very powerful topic. Because in these days and times, so many things are going on around us. And sometimes it seems, it seems as if the devil wants to steal our joy from us. But we learn that staying joyful as a Christian. Circumstances and situations will come. But I tell you, joy comes from within. Amen? And that is the only thing we can have from God. God gives us joy from within. Hallelujah. So be a part of a home group. It is a blessing, and we can go together. Amen? We go together when we are part of home groups. So be a part if you are not yet a part of one, or if you want to start one, you are very welcome to do so, and you can see Lillian. Amen? I hope you have been blessed today. I wish you a great week ahead, and God bless you. Amen. Thank you very much. Thanks. We have reached the end of our service, and um, before I pray for the blessing prayer, I would like to remind us that uh, Wolf has all the new copies of the book, um, Seven Biblical Economics principles. So it's available, either you can order it online or in physical form. I'd like to encourage you to consider it as a Christmas gift that you can buy for your friends or your family. Yeah. And all the proceeds of this book will go back to ICC. Yeah. Shall we stand? Charles, thank you for the word. I think it's so, rem so important for us, our relationship with God will ultimately, especially for you who are fathers, affect the way you relate with your children as well. Yeah? So ask God to reveal to you, uh, to restore this, this, and he will also restore this level as well. Amen? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Praise God.